You've been hearing us talk about Imperial Yeast for a while now, and that's because we absolutely love this stuff. With 200 billion cells in each pitch right pouch, we rarely even need to make starters these days. Unfortunately, not everybody has the access to Imperial Yeast, those of us out here on the West Coast do, because they're based out of Portland, Oregon. But things are about to change. Imperial Yeast is excited to announce the opening of their East Coast location, which is huge for those who want the freshest yeast possible with the best pitch rates, but brew on the other side of the country. They're going to start by offering their four most popular strains, A38 Juice, A07 Flagship, L13 Global, and GO3 Deer, with the goal of providing their full lineup of yeast by mid-2021. So start your planning now at imperialyeast.com. One of the coolest things about beer, in my opinion, is the regional influence on certain styles. Here in the United States, we're sort of known for clean ale uh, that tends to be hopped rather highly. In Germany, it's delicate lagers and vice beer. Fascinatingly, the relatively small country of Belgium has had a huge influence on beer and brewing with their characterful ales that display fruity esters and spicy phenols. And some brewers use additional ingredients to amplify those flavors. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And on this episode, I'm joined by contributor Cade Job to talk about using fruit in Belgian ale. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Belgian beer, uh, you know, you, you said it was a small country that's had a huge impact on beer, but it's really had a huge impact on the cross between beer and food, hmm. in my opinion. I mean, Belgium... Uh, is really famous and their beers are really famous for being brewed to pair with food, right? And, and so I think that's a really cool intersection uh, that Belgium has sort of, I don't know that they've trademarked, but maybe that they've especially been interested in perfecting. And so one of the ways they do that is by adding fruit uh, to their beers, you know, adding actual food uh, to the beers, which I think is really cool. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. It, you know, I when I think of Belgium, I, I certainly do think of them as being kind of masters of the gustatory, you know, sciences yeah. uh, with chocolate and, and, and French fries and food and all of that stuff. And yeah, I recall a time when Belgian styles were really popular for homebrew. Uh, you know, we used to joke about that being the case because the fermentation character could more easily cover up mistakes. But I trust the real reason was because getting your hands on good Belgian ale over here wasn't terribly easy. And it seems kind of more so today. You've got uh, domestic breweries who are really masterfully making these Belgian styles. I'm not entirely sure what changed, but it seems like people just aren't brewing these styles as much anymore. I don't brew very much with fruit. Uh, in fact, I can count on one hand the times I've made beer with fruit in it, uh, but I can definitely see how it would contribute positively to certain Belgian styles and look forward to chatting with you about it, Cade. All right. If you like what we're up to and you want to help us keep doing it, consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy. By committing to a small monthly pledge over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Our guest for March is Vito DeLucci, who recently opened Imperial Beer Project in Brentwood, California, and he also works kind of behind the scenes at More Beer. Vito has a ton of brewing experience as evidenced by his multiple awards uh, and is just a rad dude uh, all around. If you have questions for Vito or even just want to lurk during the live Q&A session, make sure to make your che uh, your pledge of just $3 or more by Friday, March 26, 2021 at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Vito session will be held that Saturday, the 27th. So getting your pledge in before then will give us enough time to add you to the private Facebook group where all of these sessions take place and are stored so that you can go back and watch them whenever you like. Another really easy way to support us is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support when you're doing your online shopping. Your experience doesn't change at all and we get a little kickback for the referral. Finally, if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and a review in Apple Podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts, we really, really would appreciate it. It helps people who may not have heard of us uh, to more easily find the show. Plus, it just kind of makes us feel warm and fuzzy. So uh, feedback this week is brought to you by Brewers Hardware who specialize in tri-clover compatible sanitary fittings, conical fermenters, kettles, and brew stands. Uh, Brewers Hardware offers a variety of unique items for home and craft brewers, including high-quality stainless fittings at great prices with super-fast shipping. Learn more at BrewersHardware.com. And don't forget to mention Brewlosophy at checkout to receive a free gift. That's BrewersHardware.com. 
Listener and mead maker extraordinaire Mark Pellicle had some feedback for us on our our recent episode about carbonating Saison. He said, when speaking about Saison, you mentioned there were two parts, the initial sac ferment and then the diastaticus part. That's not exactly true because the diastatic power is from the yeast via the STA genes. The enzymes break down complex dextrins into fermentable sugar, which the yeast then metabolize into alcohol. The genes that make these enzymes up are regulated by the presence of oxygen. I bring up this point not to be a contrarian, but because you could carb a beer by adding non-fermentable dextrins, he put that in quotes, which would subsequently be enzymatically converted to fermentable sugars and then carbonate a beer. If you don't believe me, just look at the left-hand brewing fiasco. Now, for those who may not know of what this fiasco is, Mark is referring to this this thing that occurred uh, with left-hand brewing being forced to dump $2 $2 million in beer when it was contaminated by yeast that had diastaticus present in it. In fact, I believe they ended up suing White Labs because of it. Um, it you know, you make a really good point, Mark. What do you think, Kid? Yeah, that's a really fantastic point. I uh, am a hun- I- I'm not up on the science um, from diastaticus. Sounds like a really good episode idea for the brew lab. Um, but I one of the things I know about diastaticus is it does you know, while I think Mark is correct, it certainly takes place at the same time, right? Like it's chewing on those long chain dextrins and breaking them down uh, so that the yeast can, you know, uh, ferment those sugars. But I think it also occurs slower uh, if I, if I'm, if I uh, uh, am, am, am correct. But it, that, that slowness is what I think the problem was with left hand, right? They didn't realize that the beer was going to keep chewing these dextrins, right? You, you know, you've got a certain amount of residual sugars in all beer and they didn't know that the yeast that was still in the package was just going to keep fermenting and, you know, exploding cans right. and packages, you know? So I think that's a, uh, so I think honestly, you're both, correct right his feedback but also what y'all said on uh uh you know on the the saison podcast i think is also true too i i get what mark is saying and he's 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 almost if i'm if i'm reading his email correctly what he's saying is use diastaticus to your benefit right uh because if you package maybe with i don't know less less uh, uh, of your standard short chain dextrins that do get fermented out that you could still get decent preferable carbonation from the diastaticus piece of that yeast. Um, I'm, I'm te- I don't use those types of yeast very often at all anyways, except for when I'm making cider, because I do use that Bell Saison, or um, I'll, I'll use some Saison strain that might have the variant. But uh, to me, it's just a little bit unpredictable. And I, so I, I would just be concerned about relying on that for um, natural carbonation in the first place and probably just stick to to forced carbonation in those instances because I feel safer to me. But I think you make a good point, Mark. And as always, we really appreciate you uh, writing in with, with your interesting feedback. So uh, if you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. I've noticed an interesting trend over the last couple of years with brewers making so-called rice beers, where a relatively large portion of, of actual rice in some form is included in the grist. These beers are usually lagers, though I have also seen some rice IPAs, which sound really interesting to me. Uh, I think the idea is to produce a really dry and drinkable beer, whatever the style may be. Well, listener Brian Summers was curious about this whole thing and made a pale lager with jasmine rice that he then aged for a bit on sake-soaked oak. Brian called this beer Turning Japanese and sent me a bottle to share with my friends. One Minute Beer Review with Jersey and Tim. Nice and clear. Looks like a champagne. Yeah, or a cider, yeah. It's really dry. It tastes like a champagne to me. It's like a champagne. Like, it kind of does, yeah. Champagne of beer. Is this Miller High Life? Yeah. I like it. I think it's, it's like champagne. It's like a champagne beer. Yeah, it's kind of blah. It, it drinks It drinks nice. There's no bad aftertaste. Seems like the esters and phenols are pretty balanced. The midichlorians are, there's a heavy midichlorian count. Nailed it. Yeah, this one has lots of midichlorians. I have no idea what it is. No, Do I, I don't I don't. I don't either. It seems super expensive and fancy. It does seem fancy. It's good, Timmy. Yeah. I like it. It's got a little bit of a kick at the end. Right at the end. Uh, Tastes a little boozy. Yeah. A little boozy kick. I, I, I get it. Like, I don't know. Like, it's a pretty good. It's pretty good beer. It's all right. We'll, we'll go. I'll go six. Yeah, six is good. Yeah. Yeah. Six is good. It obviously wasn't Miller High Life, but I totally see where the guys were coming from with the whole champagne thing. It was super dry, pretty doggone fizzy, and surprisingly clean, despite being, you know, aged on sake-soaked oak. Uh, I have no idea what the hell midichlorians are. I don't know. Where, that's probably from some movie reference that I've never seen. Uh, so I can't comment on that, but the esters and phenols were, were balanced, I guess. 
you don't know what midichlorians are? Come I, on. How I you, have I mean, no idea. He says it all the time. I have no clue what Jesus. it is. Jesus. It's uh, Star Wars, okay? It's the things that make that give Jedi their powers. I can't uh, believe you don't know that. I don't I've said before I was never a Star Wars guy. Still to this day. <laughs> I've tried watching the one well, I guess it's not the first episode now, but the first one that came out, you know, in the 80s with my son and we both fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually I I use uh, I use Star Wars to help my 2-year-old go to sleep too, so maybe there's something to that. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I, the the fact that they call the champagne that was you know when they whenever they started talking about the champagne flavors, I was wondering how much those sake oak cubes actually impacted hmm. the flavor because I could certainly see that right, like a sake and the the oak cubes adding that really crispness and then you know high carbonation yeah. sounds like a really good beer. Um, and I you know that champagne style, I was originally thinking brute IPA, but you know, they didn't really get a lot of hop character, more just like that crisp dry, which makes me interested to see, like, maybe I could do like a super carbonated, like, you know, like they did, like he did sort of like a rice pilsner with a champagne yeast and get some like crazy, interesting beer hmm. flavors, like super highly carbonated. Interesting idea. Yeah, it, it really is. This idea of using uh, it, it higher amounts of rice and also, in my opinion, corn are, are both really, really interesting for me. Because I love crushable, you know, refreshing beer. Uh, one of the things that I wrote in my in my notes that I'm realizing was I wasn't even thinking at the time about the jasmine rice, but jasmine is notably floral, and to me, this beer had that really nice, uh, not like like uh, potpourri floral, but like that really nice uh, uh, jasmine rice floral character to it. Man, I got to tell you, Brian did a good job with this beer. I didn't get any booze uh, notes from it. Saki isn't known for being super high in alcohol, so that makes sense to me. But I also didn't get a really strong oak flavor. Uh, to me, it was just this really clean, curious. I mean, it was it was obviously an interesting beer, uh, uh, but it was, but it was c super clean, like not, not as oaky or as sake -y as you would get. Uh, to me, the, the jasmine rice really did kind of shine through in that floral note. So really cool idea. Uh, I'm excited to mess around with using rice in uh, my beers in the future as well. Thanks for sending that in, Brian. Uh, if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in reviewed by Jersey and Tim, email me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and we'll get you all set up. All right, we've got to cut to a quick break. When we come back, the focus will be on using fruit in Belgian ale. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com, that's grainfather.com, and get started today. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code 
code BREWPOD. That's B-R-U-P-O-D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. Given my rather strong preference for cleaner styles of beer, I don't get around to making or even drinking Belgian ale that much these days, but that's not to say I don't appreciate and enjoy a well-made version. I actually find them quite refreshing. One thing I've never done is brewed a Belgian style with fruit, but I can see it working really well with the characterful fermentation character present in such styles. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, that's the first thing I think about whenever I think of Belgian ales is I think about that Belgian yeast character, right? That highly estery and phenolic yeast. And those things, uh, those the, the profile that those things give, the aroma and flavors of those esters and phenols, uh, they go really well, like I said, at the top of the show with foods, right? And and so it makes a lot of sense that uh, Belgians would, would want to add food, you know, fruits and such things to their beers whenever they can match these sort of yeast profiles it's really really cool and and of course belgian has belgium has a long long history of fruiting their ales i mean mm-hmm. i think most people have gonna are going to have had lindemann's frambois mm-hmm. uh, even here in the united states a raspberry beer they've also got creek pesh um and then a grape one which i'm forgetting the name of right now you know but but fruits in beers are uh, popular in in Belgium. I mean, obviously, they're probably not the most popular styles that Belgians are drinking, but there's certainly been around for a while. You made a point earlier about saying that, uh, you know, Belgians have a long history of, of all things food food related, right? They're they're kind of known for that. And, and I hadn't really considered it in the way that, that you said it, where naturally it would it would make sense for a culture that is so food oriented to, to make beers that amplify aspects of food uh, that they really enjoy or that work really well together with those foods. Um, real briefly, let's just talk a little bit about Belgian ale in general. We all know, I mean, when, I think when a lot of people think of, uh, of fruited beer these days, they do kind of go toward the sour ale. And, and that's not really what we're focusing on. We're talking about your classic Belgian blonde, your, your you know, that the, the, those clean, <laughs> they're not clean, but they're not sour or funky either. Those Belgian ales you, that, where you get those esters and those phenols and that bubblegum characteristic. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, there's not a lot of hops in Belgian ales generally, uh, you know, or, or, you know, especially some of the like lambics and sour ales, they'll, they'll use old hops, you know, just to get sort of a bittering uh, component to it with no flavor. Um, you know, you can have hops in Belgian ales. That's not to say that they don't have it, but generally it's the yeast that really shines, right? Yeah. It's those, like I said, it's that clove character or it's the fr- like nice fruity esters uh, that, that, sort of, that sort of make the beer what it is and makes it sort of distinctly Belgian. I hear people, especially homebrewers, all the time talk about that Belgian character, right? And <laughs> yeah. and I feel like if you've had enough Belgian beers, you sort of, you can hear somebody say that and go, oh yeah, yeah, I got it. I know oh, what yeah. that is. I can and almost it, taste it when, when it's being talked about, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's weird. It's like my mind mentally brings it up. Yeah, and and a lot of those same characters are things that you get from fruit, mm-hmm. right? So So, you know, not even just like... I mean, there's obviously the sour ales pair really nicely with fruit because fruits are tart, right? They have that sort of acid in it, citric acid and, and all the other, um, you know, fruit-based acids. So it also makes a lot of sense, too, that the sour ales would lend themselves really nicely yeah. uh, to being fermented with fruits. But but not all, you know, I mean, again, Belgian ales are, like you said, sort of that balanced malty, evenly malty, you know, not very hoppy, just kind of good sort of day drinking ales is kind of how I think about it, but with that best Belgian yeast character. Yeah. You know, when, when I think of non-sour Belgian beer, uh, kind of a, a few things come to mind. Obviously you've got your group of Trappist beers. You got, you know, your ankle, your double, your triple and your quad. Um, and, and those are delicious fruited as well. Um, I, I actually had a, uh, I forget what the fruits were, but it was multiple fruits that a home brewer here, uh, put in a double and it was you oddly enough, it, you, you wouldn't have, the first thing you would have noticed in drinking this beer wouldn't have been the fruit in there because it tasted like a really well-made balanced double and the fruit. And I think this is key when, when it comes to talking about fruited Belgian styles or, or Belgian beers is the key is complementary. It's not like these uh, styles of fruited beer today where the fruit is the star of the show. It's not a it's not a milkshake IPA fruity version. You know, it really, in my opinion, at least you're using that fruit to amplify other aspects of the beer part of the beer 
not just put that fruit on show. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I mean, you can put the show on, or put the fruit on show in the beer. But but yeah, it's that it's that marriage. It's that amplification of of the flavors that just make it really, really nice. And uh, the double that I did with plums, uh, I served it to my dad and my dad is very much a, uh, you know, Keystone Light you know, pale, fizzy lager drinker. Uh-huh. Um, but I served this to him and and he was, and he tasted it and he said, yeah, I'd drink that. I'd actually drink quite a bit of that. That's really good. <laughs> um, and, you know, to see a, a Belgian beer that's got all this, you know, fruit and, and character in it and my dad who drinks fizzy lager to go, yeah, that's really good. It's interesting that you say that because it is sort of the marriage, right? It's the marriage of those things that made it just a pleasant, uh, drinkable beer. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And when, when I think of... Belgian ale. To, to me, you, you were saying something about hops not being a real huge contributor to flavor in these styles. I agree. Uh, to me, the two main players, uh, like you mentioned, one, obviously the yeast. There's a very particular fermentation character Belgium is known for. Uh, that, that, and, and it's very interesting. Uh, you're, you're using yeast that tend to create uh, increased amounts of isoamyl acetate, which which can give you that kind of banana character. Uh, you've got uh, four vinyl glycol, which is kind of a clovey characteristic that you can get. And these yeasts, you know, there's a lot of talk about these yeast being temperature uh, sensitive, meaning that it, and I believe the, the common saying is the cooler you ferment, the more 4VG you're going to get. The warmer you ferment, the more isoamyl acetate or banana or even just uh, other more generic fruity esters are going to be uh, a kicked out uh, and that if you find that kind of happy medium around 20 C or 68 degrees Fahrenheit you can you can really kind of coax both of those characteristics out of that yeast an interesting thing that that uh, some friends of mine went to Belgium uh, it must have been five or six years ago now they their families went to Belgium on one of those uh, beer tours and you know they got to we got all got, got jealous over here because we we're getting pictures of them sitting in Cantillon and stuff like that um, but one of the things they came back uh, kind of a, a realization that they came back with was a lot of American Belgian ales, uh, whether there's fruit in them or not, are like these embellished versions of Belgian beers. And they, they were saying that when they were drinking, you know, uh, um, your your standard Belgian beer over in Belgium, that that ester and phenol character wasn't as in your face as it is in a lot of styles over here. I don't know why that is. I mean, it could just be a function of home brewers doing home brewing things, or uh, I'm not too sure. But but it's one of those things that for me really gave uh, kind of increased my respect for that style and interest because I found uh, that that kind of overemphasized Belgian character, uh, if you will, kind of off putting. Uh, but when you when the, you know Sean and Aaron and these guys who went over there started making these Belgian ales when they came back, that were phenomenal. I mean, it really was much more in balance. And to me, that works even better when you've got a more balanced Belgian character and then you're adding fruits in a way where you're layering it in with those characteristics. Just beautiful. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's interesting you, you bring that up. I wonder if it's because, you know, again, they're, they're, the point of the beers in Belgium is to, uh, you know, pair them with food. Yeah. So I'm wondering if, you know, here in America, you kind of want, uh, or here in the United States, you kind of want that Belgian yeast to, to create a difference, right? You like, you want it to stick out, uh, to, tr- to be different than the other beers that are on tap. Uh, you know, like, so if I'm just drinking a regular, uh, you know, American pale ale, and then I see, oh, there's a Belgian pale ale over here. What's the difference there? Not just the hop character, but also the yeast character. Maybe that's also sort of one of the reasons. And then, you know, like we said, it ma- it matches, um, you know, so well uh, with 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 fruit. Yeah, I, I think there's, uh, the, you know, y- the the best brewers are those who can think about the impact every ingredient is going to have on their beer and then use it to their to their advantage, right? Um, we talked about yeast fermentation character, obviously very important in Belgian styles, but also the grains that are used. I mean, the, you know, I think special B, right? That is a classic Belgian mm-hmm. grain mm-hmm. specialty grain that is known to impart. Uh, you know, dark dried fruit, raisin, plum, uh, uh, pruny type of characteristics to beer that can easily be overdone. But when when used deftly uh, is is defines, you know, certain Belgian styles. And you think about what can be paired with that, you know, what can be mixed with those kind of darker, you know, uh, uh, raisiny flavors to, to amplify the fullness, the full gestalt of a, of a Belgian style beer. Yeah. Plums is what I added to that Belgian 
uh, double. And that was the reason why, because a double has those dark fruity characters. And I love that sort of plum jamminess that you get from adding that to a double. So yeah, those, the marriage and the way that the grains, uh, you know, the, the grain bill in a double, or at least in my versions of double is pretty, uh, pretty exotic, uh, you know, or pretty, there's a lot of different malts and stuff in there contributing different flavors. Uh, but yeah, it's all centered around, uh, that, that dark fruit character. And so, you know, making that nice double with that dark fruit character why not add some fruit to it to accentuate it just makes a nice easy pairing and certainly seems like something that would be relatively easy for somebody to try to do if they're looking to up their up their game a little bit so what let, let's talk a little bit about other fruits you might consider using to meld with uh, Belgian characteristics in other styles. I mean, if you're going with a paler, uh, like a Belgian pale ale or even something like an ankle, a Belgian blonde or uh, Trappist blonde style, what I, I like when I think of those again, I, I've never done this. I'm not a big user of fruit in my brewing in general. But when I when I think of the characteristics of kind of a paler Belgian beer, I, I, you know, I do. I expect a little bit of that banana. And to me, some peach uh, in there would be really good. I could see that actually going really well. And then you think about like peaches with, with, uh, you know, the standard spices that you might use in a peach cobbler, maybe some cinnamon, some clove. You're going to get that from that Belgian yeast anyways. And it just seems like that would work really well. Yeah, for sure. Peach. Um, I, I think about stone fruits like apricots and cherries and, uh, you know, those, those sorts of things, the, the, the stone fruits, the fruits that have pits, uh, pits in them. And yeah, like you said, that, that peach uh, matching with the cloves and things that you would put in like a peach cobbler. I mean, there's a reason why <laughs> those things taste so good yeah. and why you can use peach in beer that way. But yeah, that's kind of what I try to think about uh, whenever I'm adding fruit to a Belgian beer is what goes good with those spice, you know, with like you said, clove or, uh, you know, the banana flavors uh, that that come out of that, that Belgian yeast. You know, I think of like a triple that's got like, you know, really strong, really pronounced flavors, got some high alcohol content, you know, that would be really good with some like apricot Mm -hmm. uh, in it, you know, an apricot triple would be really tasty because you just it and the apricot's not meant to overpower, right? It's not meant to be like an apricot juice bomb. It's meant to be an an addition, like subtle aroma and flavor change. And that's where I really think you know, the nuance of adding fruit and and how you do that in a Belgian ale is what's really important. You, you know, something we haven't hit on yet, uh, surprisingly, because we're talking about fruit in Belgian beer is, uh, you know, Belgian wit, b- uh, wit beer, uh, oh, yeah, which is known yeah. for having uh, an orange character to it, you know, uh, and and I believe the, the primary way that people are getting that orange flavor, that orange character in wit beer is by using uh, like orange rind, um, you know, or orange zest, uh, dried dried orange peel, whatever whatever form. Um, but yeah, that is it, again, that's just another example of the commonness that that you know fruit is used and works really well in these styles that have the fermentation character that it does. Um, I, you know, I when I think of triple, I believe Ray actually has a recipe for a for a Belgian triple that has uh, coriander and a little bit of orange peel in it as well. So kind of kind of going down that same path of wit beer. Uh, but in a much stronger and less, I guess, less fermentation character forward style. It's still going to have that that Belgian character, just not as strong as a whip beer. But yeah, uh, you know, you, you think about what works. And also that booziness, there's something about fruit uh, additions to kind of balance the higher alcohol thing that works really well, too. Yeah, fruit are nicely sweet, right? And they met, and they match really well with, with alcohol. I mean, I'm sure plenty of us out there have soaked fruits um, in, you know, various liquors and, you know, eaten those fruits, <laughs> you know, over <laughs> over our lifetimes. You know, I mean, certainly in Texas, we did it all the time, soaking that those watermelons and vodka, That's um, right. you know, eating those in the summer for sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can also see where where this the the sweetness that that you would get from a fruit matches really nicely uh, with the sweetness that you get from beer, right? I mean, those sugars themselves at a at a fundamental level are not very dissimilar. You know, they are distinct, right? Like fructose is obviously different than maltose, um, you know. But the but the individual components of the different sugars and things like that they, they marry really well. They pair in just such a really nice way that creates this really really fantastic gestalt. So let's talk a little bit about some considerations when using fruit and beer in general. Um, I, you know, a I, I, couple of things that, that kind of go together is you got to be, obviously, we're, we're making beer. We know how easy it is for beer to be contaminated. Uh, so you got to be, you got to consider how you're going to, how you're going to deal with that fruit. And then the method that you're going to use for getting that fruit into the beer, I think 
kind of the, the most obvious idea would be just to use the whole fruit. I know that there's a lot of concerns people have with that because when, I mean, you, if you take a whole batch of apples and you crush them all up without doing anything to them, that, that apple juice is going to naturally ferment into probably a pretty delicious cider actually. Uh, but, but we, you, if you don't want that happening, right, then you have to treat the fruit in some other way. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is kind of where we, we get into this sort of, um, you know, it's a multi-level consideration, right? Like talking about how and when to add the fruit, yeah. uh, it kind of depends on when you want to add the fruit as to how you want to add the fruit and vice versa, right? So I, I think there's a lot of considerations to think about. You know, obviously the first way that most people would think about doing it is just not process the fruit at all and mm-hmm. just add the fresh fruit. You know, but then you sort of have a consideration, like you said, that fresh fruit contains sugars that yeast will consume and ferment. You know, I mean, the, the easiest way to think about that for me is everybody knows that wine is made from grapes, yeah. right? And and clearly grapes taste different than wine, than the fermented product, right? <laughs> uh, so, so there's definitely a change that happens to the fruit character when you use just fresh fruit in the presence of yeast, right? So then you sort of have, I mean, it, we'll, we'll talk about like, you know, maybe when to add fruit here in a minute. But that brings up a a good question. So, okay, well, if I want to make sure that the yeast, you know, don't consume the fruit, do I just add the fruit at the end after the yeast are all done doing their job? Right. Should I add it at the boil and, uh, you know, boil down the fruit so that maybe the something about the sugars changes or or any of those things? And you kind of have to answer these questions when you're thinking about adding fruit, you know, and and that's one of the things that that I, I think gives a lot of people pause and maybe makes them go, well, I don't really want to think about all that stuff so I'm not going to add fruit but it's also <laughs> it's also sort of to me it gives you a, a lot of options to just say hell I, I've got some hey look I've got some peaches that are about to go bad in the refrigerator I'm just going to throw them in the fermenter and see what happens you know yeah um, so I think you get a lot of ability to experiment yeah and and you know again point at introduction of fruit I think is a is a big decision a big consideration you got to make um, there's, but like you said, if you toss in certain fruits during the boil, you're going to drive off some of their volatiles, you know, oils and, and other things that you might want to keep around in the beer. But by doing that, you do mitigate the risk of contamination because you're boiling just like you do with wort, you're boiling it. So you're probably killing off any contaminants. Um, another, another way to treat fruit that I, you see quite often, actually, particularly if you're going with whole fruit or fresh fruit is to chop it up and then freeze it. Uh, And there's a couple benefits to doing that. I know people talk about one of which is uh, probably the biggest thing you hear is that when you do that, uh, those, the crystals that are formed will break those cell walls so that when the uh, fruit, uh, I think it's most fruits actually, but when that fruit uh, thaws back out, it's going to be much more sludgy and uh, you know, release its goodness into the, into the beer uh, more readily. Yeah, the cell walls and the cell membranes that are kind of holding everything together are, are going to burst, right? Like, or at least that's what that's what I think most people uh, suggest whenever they're freezing. So yeah, your the yeast now has access to those sugars a little bit more readily, and that's also something too, right? Like if you're using fresh fruit. Um, the yeast is going to ferment the sugars, but again, how much? Yeah. Right. And so, so you sort of have some variability in the in in your outcome. Like, let's say that I've got fresh fruit and I pitch it at from at you know while while yeast is going uh, in the fermenter. That that fruit is going to change. It's actually going to be fermented out. But just like malt, there's other stuff in there. There's yeah. start. There's starches, there's dextrins that don't ferment out, and then there's aroma and flavor compounds that also don't, uh, that, that stay in the beer. Same thing with frozen, and that's kind of the reason, one of the reasons why people say if you're going to use fruit, it's better to do it frozen because of that, because the access to the sugars um, is much, much better, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know that we've done like a fresh versus frozen fruit experiment yet. I know it's on the list, uh, certainly something we want to do. But yeah, that's you know, that that's the general idea. And it certainly makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, another way uh, that you can use fruit is by using a concentrate. And this is if you're going to if you're going to home make your own concentrated fruit sludge stuff, <laughs> Uh, it, it's another good way to mitigate the risk of, of contamination because it, usually it involves condensing, you know, the fruit down in a pot and then cooling it off before adding it to your beer. In fact, I believe Jason Cipriani uh, from Brewosophy here had a 
cranberry, some sort of a cranberry beer or cider where he did just that, uh, you know, concentrated down the cranberries, added it to the beer, fermented it out. Uh, and, and that, that can work as well, but you can also purchase concentrated fruit. Uh, Oregon fruit products is a very popular company that, that produces these canned or bagged for, for the larger scale concentrates. Really, really good stuff, by the way, uh, and used for baking, used for used for beer as well. Uh, but that's a way to do it. And then kind of a, a similar to that would be fruit extracts. And I, I'm not exactly sure how extracts are made, but they tend to be very, very strong, right? Uh, and, and will contribute, in my experience, more of the, um, I don't want to use the word artificial in a negative way, but kind of what you expect from like an artificial fruit flavor, that, that's been my experience with extracts, which can be really, really pleasant, right? You don't have to use as much. Uh, and when you, and you're getting, you're contributing, you know, you, you eat a watermelon Jolly Rancher. It doesn't taste like watermelon, but people still love the watermelon Jolly Rancher flavor, you know? Yeah, exactly. So that, that whole category of purees, juices, and extracts, I mean, I think that's what most commercial brewers are using whenever they're uh, adding fruit to beer. And one of the main reasons is because of loss of yield, right? right. If you add a whole bunch of fruit pits and, and you know, seeds and, and pith and, and uh, skins and, and all that sort of stuff, you know, it's going to gum up your works. It's going to gum up your, your fermenters. You're not going to be able to transfer. Um, and so there's also some, some you know, disadvantages to doing fresh fruit and, uh, you know, frozen fruits just in general in terms of process concerns. Yeah. And that's where you get to these like pur- purees, juices, and, and fruits. The other thing too, um, depending on when you add these, especially with like an extract, you're going to preserve the original fruit flavor right. and character, right? So that flavor is not going to change a whole lot because, uh, you know, because you're not adding those sugar, the, the, the sugars that are going to ferment out. Now, purees and juices, of course, will. And they're maybe easier to add because you just get to dump them, you know, into the fermenter or into the boil or wherever you're adding them, uh, you know, and, and they're not going to they don't require any pre-handling or freezing or any of that stuff. Uh, so, so, so they're really easy to use. The other thing with purees and juices is they ship really well for the most part. Uh, you know, so you're able to get fruits and stuff that may not be available at your, at your, uh, you know, local grocery store or farmer's market or wherever it is, uh, that you're buying fruit. So, so you, you may have a little bit more access to fruits, uh, that you wouldn't normally consider brewing with like boysenberries. I don't know that I can buy boysenberries at my local grocery store. Uh, but I know that there are, you know, uh, purees and juices that are canned uh, that can get there. Now, one other thing I'll say about purees, juices, um, concentrates and extracts is they are often sweetened, right? And so you want to make sure that if you're, if you're, getting something like that and it is sweetened that you know what sweetener is in there because that's also (laughs) going to change your your outcome that that's a really good point uh and and that's one of the reasons i like the uh you you know the the brands out there that are marketed toward brewers they're they're making sure not to do that kind of stuff because they know the the methods or the 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 reasons for use right um so they're usually they're kind of advertising the fact that it is just pure fruit which is a good thing and one benefit to the the concentrates extracts all that stuff is that they're also uh, generally fairly shelf stable and pasteurized. So you don't have to worry. You can, you know, sanitize the top of the bag or the, or the can open that bad boy up and and toss it into the beer. And you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, what if there's, what if there's still living organisms on this that could ruin the beer. So I think that's a huge benefit. Um, Even on the homebrew scale, uh, I'm, I I tend to not want to lose too much beer. And so uh, the, the, the fact that you're, you, your, your beer loss in the end from using a concentrated form of fruit, uh, I feel like that's kind of of a benefit as well. Now, there is another thing that we, when we've talked about tinctures in the past on the show, there's another thing, uh, 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 th- this is another way that you can get that fruit character into beer. Let's talk a little bit about what exactly a tincture is and how to go about making one. Yeah, so a tincture very simply is just soaking something in alcohol, right? Soaking it into, in a in a high, uh, you know, a spirit, uh, like a, a very high percentage alcohol, like a vodka or an Everclear or grain alcohol. Um, any of those things. And what it does is it pulls out those flavor and volatile compounds, right? It pulls them out, um, but but you leave sort of the the sugar, right? The the long chain dextrins and, and sugars and stuff uh, in inside the fruit. So it's a way to sort of pull flavor without actually adding any uh, fermentable sugars or or you know to the beer. So one way I like to think about it is 
and I'm not sure that this is always true, uh, but one of the ways that I like to think about it is it sort of preser- preserves that fruit flavor. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, grapes versus wine. Wine obviously tastes different than if you just pressed out, you know, grapes and and drank grape juice, right? And it's because there's there's fewer sugars uh, in it, and and so grapes taste different than wine does. Now, a lot of the grape flavor carries through to wine, sure. and that's a good thing, but it does change. And so that's one of those things with tinctures that I think is really useful. Um, you know, is is you know you're making you're you're keeping that fruit flavor the same as where if you were just taking a bite out of the fruit, yeah. right? And and I think that's where that's where you get you know at least to me, and I and I'm not sure if that's actually scientifically what happens, but when I've used tinctures in the past, that's sort of what I've seen. Um, the other thing about tinctures that uh, is I think is really cool is that with fruits you get pectin uh, whenever you use them, yeah, and that's across fresh, frozen, you know, concentrates, purees, juices, there's a lot of pectin that's going to sit in that juice. And that pectin uh, can essentially cause haze right. uh, in the beer. And so one way that you can avoid fruit haze but still get fruit flavor um, is by using tinctures. You know, the, the haze thing is a curious thing for me. When I when I first made a fruited cider years and years ago, I bought a uh, pectin enzyme or pectic enzyme or whatever they call it to combat the haze that I presumed I was going to get from adding berries to my to my cider. Um, I've not used it but once, and it's it's very, very interesting observation. And I know this is a, as an aside here, but but I'll ha- I'll be making a cider. Fermentation of just the juice will be complete. The cider's completely hazy, all that. I add that uh, four pounds of mixed berry stuff from from Costco. It ferments out, and then I cold crash, and it is crystal clear. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but but yes, you do make a good point that by doing making a tincture, you're leaving a lot of that stuff behind. The biggest thing that you're leaving behind is the fruit flesh. I mean, you're I, I've I've seen uh, uh, you know posts on the internet of people making tinctures and then adding the entire thing, including the actual fruit or whatever it is they're soaking in the tincture to the beer. But that is not the traditional way of doing it, right? You're you're usually filtering out the fleshy fruit part and just putting the flavorful booze into the into the beer. Yeah, exactly. And- and, and, you know, the question always becomes how much booze to add, yeah. <laughs> right? Because you don't want to just dump, you know, a, a, a whole, you know, let's call it 750 mLs of, of uh, Everclear, you know, yeah. Everclear into your beer. <laughs> um, uh, you, that's obviously going to change the way that things taste. So the question is always kind of, kind of how much. And, and my answer to this is really crappy, uh, but it's enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I and I know you know listening to the podcast, you're going to kind of go, well, okay, thanks, that's really useless. Um, <laughs> you know, enough is just enough to get the flavors out of the fruit, and so it kind of does depend on how much fruit you're adding, what size the fruit is, how big the flesh is, and kind of what you're going for. You know, I mean, obviously, if you're doing a whole watermelon um, and soaking it in vodka, you're going to need quite a bit of vodka. You know, you know, like a, a couple ounces of vodka isn't going to do it. Right. Uh, but if you just had some cherries or some raspberries or blueberries or something, then yeah, a couple ounces of vodka might just be enough. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of in proportion to the flavor, but generally what I do, and this is just, this is just me, this is not based on, um, you know, any recommendations or books or anything else that I've read. This is just how I've done it, is I just put enough vodka to sort of let the fruit sit in, right? Like to just cover enough of the fruit that I feel like the fruit's going to soak well. Like I don't need a, you know, a couple inches of vodka on top of the fruit. Just kind of let it sit in there. That way that there's still some water or, you know, alcohol left in the bottom and it doesn't all get sucked up, you know, into the fruit. How long do you like to let your tincture sit before you put them to use? Ah, uh, yeah, the other eternal question. Long enough. <laughs> Long uh, enough. I mean, okay. if I can give two crappy answers to this, <laughs> uh, no. I mean, I think there's the information on this. I have researched this before, and I think we mentioned this a little bit in the spice podcast uh, when we did the spice tinctures. Um, but it 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 kind of depends, you know. I mean, I probably let it sit at least forty eight hours. Um, I've done it in as little as twelve hours and hmm. had decent results. Um, you know, I've also let it sit for a week or two weeks or more. Yeah, uh, it just kind of depends pins. Usually what I'll do, especially if I'm using fruits, I find that fruits are much, uh, the, the, um, they take a little bit longer than spices, sure. uh, in my opinion. And, and I guess that's probably just because that alcohol has to, you know, get inside the fruit and pull out the flavors. But so I'll usually, what I'll do is I'll usually make the fruit on the, the fruit tincture on the same day that I'm brewing the beer. 
Um, and then I won't add the tincture until, you know, the, the, the beer's almost done fermenting. So five, seven, ten days, however long after that. And that's kind of how long I'll let the, the tincture sit. Very good. Well, you happen to have some fruit on hand that you plan to use in a Belgian ale, so you decided to test out a couple common methods for adding that fruit to your beer. Results from that experiment when we're back from this break. The brew in a bag method has blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAV experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high-quality, food-safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all-in-one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at check out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Accelerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical Growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. When I think of Belgian ale character, a few things come to mind. Fruity, banana-like esters, and peppery phenols from the yeast, as well as a dried, dark fruit flavor, uh, or fruit flavors that can be contributed by certain malts, such as Special B. Uh, when you propose an experiment comparing methods for adding plums to a Belgian ale, Kate, I was initially caught a bit off guard, but soon realized it'd probably work pretty well. Yeah, I mean, doubles have that dark fruit character, right? And plums are just a really natural addition to sort of accentuate the double, uh, you know, double character. And, and, you know, I always, or not always, but for the last several years, when it gets into the fall, I make a double with plums. And one of the reasons I do this, because my dad has um, a a ranch, um, and he's got wild plums that grow out there so we'll go and pick up those those plums and we'll make jellies and jams and mm. you know pies and all kinds of stuff with them which is fantastic yeah uh you know and and so that's kind of what inspired me to do the original version of the double bowl. and now i do it every fall because it's just a really great fall beer it's full of jam and full of plum um and really tasty and yeah i i suggested that we do this idea it's, it's not a, a you know um Jake had done one a while back with peppers, using right. chili peppers and a tincture, um, and I think that was sort of side of an, sort of an interesting application. So I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to make this double. Why don't I just try it with plums? Yeah. Um, so that's what I did. So tell us about the uh, the recipe. I know you said you make this one annually, and I think the recipe is one that you kind of uh, stick close to, at least uh, for the most part. Yeah, I generally don't mess around with this recipe anymore because I've got it kind of dialed in where I want it. Uh, and so I, for this experiment, I did a single 10-gallon um, batch, um, and I did uh, about 60% Pilsner malt, um, 8.5% Munich 1, 4% aromatic malt, 4% Cara Munich, uh, 4% Special B, <laughs> 6% Candy Syrup D45, and uh, 4% of just cane sugar, beet sugar. 
Um, so that's that's one, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> seven different um, fermentables, not including the plums that we're going to get added later. Right. So it's a pretty nuanced recipe, but man, that one really produces a nice double. And that's kind of my base double. Anytime I'm doing a double, I'll, I'll usually use that. I generally only brew doubles with fruit in them now. I don't hmm. do just plain doubles anymore because I just really love the way that that fruit character uh, character happens. But anyway... So 10 gallons of that. Um, I mashed at 147F for 64C uh, for 60 minutes and then raised it to boil, boiled for 60 minutes and just did one hop addition, just did one ounce, uh, 28 grams of magnum at 60 at 60 minutes. And that's for the full 10 gallon batch. So very, very small uh, bitterness charge on this beer. Yeah. Um, so while the uh, uh, beer was boiling, while the mash was going and while the beer was heating up and boiling, I went ahead and prepared the plums. Like I said, I sort of prepare those plums on, on brew day. So I had two pounds total of plums, so 907 grams. And the first thing I did was dice them all into chunks. Um, so cut uh, all two pounds into, into, into to nice, you know, I don't know, half inch or so uh, chunks. Yeah. And then I put one pound or 450 grams in a Ziploc bag and threw those into the freezer. So frozen, uh, froze one pound of it. And then I put the second um, half, the other pound, 450 grams in eight ounces or 235 milliliters of Everclear, which is great alcohol. And then left that just on my counter uh, at room temperature while the beer's fermented. So then uh, after the boil, uh, all the warts, uh, uh, the wort got chilled down, um, and then, then I took a hydrometer reading, and so the OG was 1.057, which is perfect uh, mm-hmm. for, a, for a double. And then I evenly split the wort into two brew buckets and placed those into my uh, controlled fermentation chamber of 66F19C and let those cool overnight uh, so that they could get down to pitching temperature. Uh, then I pitched um, a starter of Imperial Yeast B45 Gnome, uh, which is a really fun yeast. Um, interesting for this experiment, normally I use Triple Double uh, for Bell Jones, and I do think I like Triple Double a little bit better than Gnome. Gnome has that peppery yes. um, <laughs> yeah, flavor to it. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Gnome is one of those yeasts that I picked up just to experiment with, to mess around uh, with. Uh, in, kind of when, when Imperial Yeast was a, a bit younger of a company, I was just trying out a bunch of their strains, and I used it in a, I think it was a Belgian blonde or something, and absolutely, even fermented at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, it still pushes out that kind of white pepper flavor. I, I, I like it. Uh, you just have to know what to expect uh, when you're using it. Yeah, Gnome is a great Belgian yeast. Uh, there, I certainly don't have any complaints about it. I'd use it in a Belgian ale, right? Just like a, a, a nice ale. Yeah. Uh, but Triple Double to me has that clove and that fruity character hmm. that I really like in a in a double or a triple. And so that's, again, I, you know, makes sense why they call it Triple Double. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so that's the yeast I usually use. But Gnome is, is a fantastic yeast, and it does have that sort of peppery phenol. Yeah. Um, so I let it ferment, and after seven days of fermenting, I started to notice airlock activity slowing. So that's whenever I decided to add the fruit to the fermenter. So one fermenter got um, the frozen fruit, and then the other got the strained tincture. So I uh, strained the alcohol off of the fruit and then pitched just the liquid uh, into that other fermenter. So one got frozen fruit, one got just the tincture. Right. And then uh, let it sit for another four days, took hydrometer measurements, and uh, noted that final gravity had been reached. Um, interesting, there was a slight difference uh, in the final gravity. So the frozen fruit had a gravity of 1.004, uh, but the tincture had 1.003, uh, which is just slightly lower. Yeah. I, I was, you know, I'm. I, to me, one specific gravity point difference isn't really anything to worry about anyways. <laughs> that could be a, a, a factor, multiple factors contributing to that. But it did kind of make sense that by adding a, you know, um, however many, what, six ounces probably or so of, of, of a high ABV grain alcohol, you know, Everclear, uh, that you might, you might get a little bit lower of a finishing gravity just because of the impact of that. But still, you know, one point, nothing, nothing to worry about. Yeah, exactly. I, I wasn't too concerned about it. And that's pretty damn close, you know, for fruit, for actually, you know, the, the yeast fermenting the fruit and then adding, you know, like I said, alcohol from the tincture. Yeah. Pretty damn well, close. And, and one thing to point out here as well is you didn't stabilize the, the beer before adding the, the fleshy fruit uh, or the tincture for that matter, which means that there was some uh, secondary fermentation occurring 
in your primary uh, after adding the fruit. So the the argument that, oh, the tincture one has all this extra booze in it because you added actual Everclear to it. Well, well, you know, maybe it did have a slightly higher amount of alcohol in the end. There's no real good way to measure that on the homebrew scale for us. But you also added a pound of fermentable plum juice or plum stuff, you know, from the frozen plums that also fermented out, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I add it at that temperature, right? I didn't, I, I wanted uh, some of it to ferment out. I want some of those sugars because I don't want like a really, you know, th- I want to get flavor yeah. out of it, right? Um, and I, and, and so that's, that's again, one of the reasons why I did that, not waiting until it's already cold. And I would say that's pretty standard um, over even like commercial brewing practices is to add those, the, the fruits, if you're going to add it towards the end of fermentation, but um, still at high enough temperatures where you are going to ferment and get that uh, get those sugars out of yeah. out of solution. Um, so yeah, then I uh, cold crash the beers uh, uh, to 34F or 1C overnight. Uh, let them sit um, for one more night before transferring to serving kegs um, and then placing them on gas in my keyser. Uh, then let them sit uh, to condition for a week and then they were ready to serve. And unfortunately, uh, they were ready to serve to you because uh, this, this <laughs> experiment was completed during COVID lockdown. Uh, so you didn't collect actual data from this, but you did run through our uh, kind of interesting self, um, you know, self triangle test thing that we've set up where you take four cups, the bottoms of two cups are marked, uh, the other two cups aren't. The two marked cups get one of the beers, the two unmarked cups get uh, the other beers, and then you have your wife in your case or, or a friend or whatever uh, randomize those cups, give you three of them, so you're randomizing uh, which the odd beer out is every time, and we do make a point to try to keep the beers in the cups at the same levels, so after a round, you might top them off, uh, but this is what you ended up having to do because of COVID. Yeah, exactly, and the whole point of the COVID experiment is try to get us as blind as possible to the actual beers that are in the glass. I mean, obviously, we know what the variable is. Uh, but again, whenever I'm looking at these things, even whenever it's, you know, we're serving to these to tasters, I try to put the variable out of my mind as much as I can. Now, it's not possible to completely do that. Right. Uh, but I but I, I do just try to look at the beers and see if I can um, observe any differences. But before we get to my results, I did want to talk real quick about uh, the appearances in the beers. And they were very similar, but the one with frozen fruit was slightly hazier uh, than the tincture beer. Now, huh. I didn't use any finings and I didn't use any pectic enzyme or anything like that um, in this batch. And so I did want to sort of just point that out uh, that, that it was slightly hazier. Now, it was just a touch. It wasn't much. I mean, we're not talking about like, you know, oh, return it. It's a milky, nasty mess. Right. Uh, it was just slightly hazier uh, than than the tincture beer. So I did want to point that out sort of before we got to the results. Kind of found that interesting. Well, I, I understand that, that you know, pictures uh, are, are limiting, uh, you know, I don't get to see the beers in real life, but I'm looking at the uh, at the photos here on the website. They look very similar. I'll just I mean, maybe there's a slight difference in haze, but they're they're pretty doggone similar. Yeah. Yeah. I'm certainly happy with both beers as long as they tasted good. (laughs) I'd be happy with both. And so let's so let's dig into my results. So uh, like Marshall said, we do 10 uh, trials of this with the with the four cups. Um, so ten trials, we would expect seven. Um, I would I would have to get seven correct in order for it to be significant, and I got ten. Uh, all 10 correct so that's 100 <laughs> percent. that's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that, that that's pretty good i was pretty easily able to tell the beers apart now they were very similar and so that's one of the things i, I wanted to just sort of drive that point home with this beer is these beers were very similar even though i was able to tell them apart it was really subtle hmm. i i served this beer to my wife and she wasn't able uh, to tell the difference. And like I said, I, I also served it to my dad and my dad wasn't able to tell the difference. So so these beers were very, very, very close together. Even though I got a 10 for 10, um, you know, I'm not, I don't know what would have happened if we had served these for tasters. I certainly was able to tell a difference, but we had at least a couple other people that, 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 that weren't. And, um, and that brings, that brings up an interesting thing that we've talked about in the past as well about this, um, the impact of sightedness when doing the triangle test. I mean, we've got listeners and, and readers out there who are adamant in their uh, wish to see us be more open about the variable before having, you know, real tasters do the triangle test. And I think this is a good example of why, maybe it's not such a bad idea because 
if I'm able to distinguish it because I can focus in on what might be different the way that you were able to, and it could be that you're just sensitive to the differences. There's always that. But I feel like there's some value in that. Now, we're, we're not going to break from you know, the industry standard and start uh, telling people the variables just yet. Uh, we want to get some more, I guess, support behind that first. But I do see how that might be valuable. And the fact that you were able to tell them apart, I trust, you know, even though you were biased. Now, barring uh, the, 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 the possibility that you just actually knew what beers were in which glasses. Now, there's always that as well. And there's an element of bias in that. But I, I trust that you actually perceived the difference between these beers. Yeah, and 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 I did, and and the the way I know that I perceived a difference in the beers is that I was able to sort of characterize the difference, and and so, so to me that's the point of knowing the variable is okay. I, it, there may be a difference between the two beers, but how do I characterize it? And so knowing yeah. the variable helps you characterize it, and and that's where I think I was able to, um, you know, once I had done my ten tests, then I just sort of sat down with the two beers and said, okay, I know this one tastes different, and and what I identified was one of the beers tasted a little sharper, and that turned out to be the tincture beer. Hmm. It just had this slight sharpness to it. Now I want to be clear, I wouldn't describe it as alcoholic, um, you know, uh, but I I wouldn't completely rule that out. I mean. It did add six ounces or so, or maybe a little bit more than that. I didn't measure the the actual volume um, that I added, uh, you know, from the tincture of, of grain alcohol. There was going to be some sort of alcoholic contribution. I assumed that that would sort of match the fir- fruit fermentation character. And, and I think based on the final gravities, we sort of saw that. But I don't think it was alcoholic. What, hmm. what I did notice is just slightly sharper. And the one with frozen fruit was just really nicely rounded. So it sort of... Um, had that like soft sort of mouth feel, whereas one just kind of had a little bit more maybe dryness or sharpness to it. Uh, safe to say that you preferred, if you had to, to force yourself to choose a preference, that you preferred the fresh fruit or the frozen fruit one over the uh, tincture? Uh, actually, I liked the tincture one better. The huh. frozen fruit one, I, I think I liked the tincture one better. I actually don't <laughs> remember which one <laughs> I liked better. Anyway, either way, they were both really good and and tasted fantastic. So I mean, that was a it was a it was a really fun experiment to see that I can do the tinctures or just do frozen fruit and and kind of create the same the same beer. Uh, you know, the one other thing that I did note about these beers in terms of flavor was gnome um, that that pretty strong phenolic character. Uh, that that gnome gives off, and, yeah. and I did definitely note that in this beer too, uh, which was great. It tasted pleasant. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, you know, I after you doing these results, and I know we've got uh, other experiment results on on uh, tinctures and such. Uh, it seems to me that that using tinctures is a is an absolutely valid way of of imparting fruit flavor or spice flavor to beers um, that doesn't necessarily negatively impact the beer, and you can get can, some pretty pungent characteristics out of it. If I'm using fruit and beer, um, it just I, I'm I'd probably be inclined to use frozen fruit or con- or like concentrated fruit out of a can only because it reduces a couple of steps. I guess you know I don't have to worry about going and getting Everclear and then soaking the fruit in it and letting it sit. I can just kind of use the frozen fruit or the you know the, the concentrated fruit whenever I want because it's already pre pasteurized and such. But you know it sounds like you're kind of cool with either uh, you know either method. Yeah, I'm I'm totally fine doing either method, and it's just probably going to depend more on what I have on hand at the time from now on. If I've got some Everclear or something like that that I can do a tincture, I might do that just because I can sort of control the fruit flavor. Sure. Uh, but I'm going to be much less concerned about just throwing frozen fruit into the fermenter uh, from now on. And, and you know, I, it was funny. One of the things I, I mentioned at the top of the show was, oh, yeah, the fruit character changes when you use fresh or frozen fruit versus, uh, you know, uh, if, if you use a tincture or an extract or something like that, um, and, and, and to just not really perceive a huge difference, a slight difference, but not a huge difference was just kind of funny and interesting to me too. <laughs> well, we got a couple, not too many, just a couple comments on, uh, on this article that we're going to get to. First one comes from Ron who says, I make tinctures for spices and hot peppers because their strength is always random from brand to brand or year to year. It makes it far easier to dose to taste. I think that is one of the biggest benefits, and I believe Drew Beecham talks about this, to using tinctures is that it's far easier to add a little bit, 
take a sample, see what you think. You can even use tinctures to, to dose by the glass. You know, I know people who are doing that. Um, so there's, there's a, a huge benefit in that because if you're adding, uh, let's say you're adding in 2020, you add a whole bunch of jalapenos to a, you know, to a pepper beer, uh, and it's not hot enough. So you increase that amount the year when you make your next batch a year later, and they just happen to be much hotter peppers. Yeah. You make a tincture, you're going to get away with being able to sample that tincture and then, and then add, uh, you know, dose it to your taste as opposed to just kind of guessing. Uh, how much flesh to add yeah that's that's a fantastic benefit the the variation in fruit or you know peppers spices and such across the different years uh yeah that that's definitely going to be a benefit of using a tincture and uh dosing it in the glass or even adding it to the keg is also a way that you can add tinctures and add just the amount that you want yeah yeah uh it's i i do think that if you are into adding things like peppers and fruit and spices to beer that that um tinctures are, are probably one of the more convenient approaches um as long as you you know as long as you don't mind adding a little bit of extra booze to your beer uh it's not too much anyway so final comment comes from will trail he left this on our facebook post about the experiment he says frozen is my preferred option wash your fruit and then rinse well the freezing knocks down microbial activity and burst the cell walls releasing fruity goodness by the time you add it to the beer the ph and abv will limit any remaining microbes i'd think yeah, I, I think that's true, too. You know, um, I, I, I do wonder about uh, microbes going just dormant at freezing yeah. versus like actually dying off. Um, one thing I will say, though, I have used a lot of fresh fruit and a lot of frozen fruit um, and, and, you know, unpasteurized versions. Uh, and I've never had a bacterial or microbial, um, you know, infection or contamination uh, based on those on the use of that. Now, that's not to say that it's not possible. It certainly is right uh, that there could be things on the outside of those skins. And I know one thing a lot of people worry about is pesticides and such if sure. you're buying, you know, fruit from grocery stores. Um but I've never, I never had that experience, um, and that may have just been me getting lucky. Uh, but I, it's never been a problem for me. So the frozen fruit, you know, killing microbial activity, I certainly think that's possible. I have some questions about it, but it's also not something that I'm just super worried about. I, I will agree, though, what Will tra what Will is saying about the whole um, by adding the fruit once the beer's fermented, that the pH of the beer plus the ABV will limit uh, the the microbial activity, and I think that's a commonly uh, kind of accepted idea. I, I, again, I'm still much more risk averse uh, when it comes to potential cam contaminations uh, in my beer. And so I'm not going to hang my hat on that. But I do think that, that you know, fermented beer clearly uh, is, is going to be slightly safer uh, to add stuff to than the non-fermented beer because, you know, you've got a lower pH, higher ABV. So you make a good point there, Will. Well, Cade, that's all we've got on uh, using fruit and Belgianelle. You got anything else for us? Yeah, I mean, uh, try it out next time that, that you make a Belgian ale. Just throw some in the permit or, you know, pull a gallon or two off and then throw some fruit in there uh, and try it that way. It's really cool. And I think you'll be really surprised how well fruit pairs with that Belgian yeast character. Yep, it absolutely makes sense to me. Now, Cade, uh, before we get going, I want to make sure that we let our listeners know that the Brew Lab is out. Uh, we've dropped a couple episodes already. It is a weekly podcast, and I think it's people are really enjoying it so far. Yeah, check it out. I mean, uh, we got a lot of cool episodes coming up. There's a lot of stuff in store. So yeah, if you haven't checked it out, please go check it out and listen to the episodes. The Brew Lab can be found pretty much anywhere uh, quality podcasts are served up. That's the B-R-U Lab, uh, and we think you're really going to enjoy it. And don't forget, you can... And read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man, no. Man.